you could turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 7. And while you're turning there, can I ask you a question? When was the last time you were really shocked and amazed by something? You know, having that experience, I think, is becoming more and more rare these days. After all, you go around the, the block a few times in this life, you see a lot, especially in our media-saturated, internet-driven culture. It, it seems like uh, the outrageous, the over-the-top seems to be, well, the regular bill of fare of the day in a lot of ways. You know, we have kind of that attitude, a bit jaded, a little bit of the uh, been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt sort of thing, no matter what we happen to see or encounter. It really takes an awful lot to shock us, doesn't it? You know, if there was ever anybody that we might excuse from having that sort of, uh, well, uh, seen it, kind of an attitude, it would have to be our Lord Jesus. You know, stop and think about it. In the book of Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2, we're told that Jesus' goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. You know, talk about somebody who's actually seen it all. Uh, to add to the fact that being God, he knows it all. Uh, you would think that a person like Jesus would be absolutely shockproof. But you know what? You'd be wrong. This morning in the book of Luke, chapter 7, a study that we could call The Man Who Shocked Jesus. We're going to see Jesus have, in a sense, an arm's length distant encounter, but a powerful encounter nonetheless, with a man whose faith Jesus actually found marvelous. We could even translate that word shocking. We're going to see what made this man's faith so shocking, the background he came from, the response he had even to the idea of connecting with Jesus, and the results of having a faith and a trust in God that not only pleasantly surprised Jesus, but also provided for this man an amazing answer to prayer that he would never forget. We'll see that God is in that business of giving us just that kind of faith as well. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Father, thank you that you're here to speak to us. Thank you that your word can lead us to a place where our ability to trust in you can grow by leaps and bounds. I pray that that's what would happen here today. I thank you that your word is powerful and active and can get through to the issues of the heart. Lord, we want to open our hearts. We don't want to just hear with our ears or receive with our minds. We want to ask you to change us again, Lord, on that heart-to-heart -heart level. Teach us what it means to trust you by this glorious example in your word, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Luke chapter 7 and verse 1 begins with these words. Now, when he concluded all these sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. Now, a, a little uh, pointer for you, uh, we amateur Bible scholars out there. Uh, if you want to stay on track in your understanding of God's Word, pay attention to the road signs you see along the way. You know, for instance, the very first word we see in Luke chapter 7 is the word now. Uh, you see the word now, it's always a good question to ask, the, uh, to ask. When? When is the now referring to? Well, immediately after Jesus has concluded what we've called the Sermon on the Plain. Now, the Sermon on the Plain is much like the Sermon on the Mount, but it has distinct differences in terms of where it was given. Even some of the content is a bit different from the classic Sermon on the Mount that we find in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. We discovered that the Sermon on the Plain was all about breaking through to a truly blessed life. And let's face it, we can't have a blessed life unless our relationships are online. And so Jesus majors on some heaven-sent perspectives about how to have our personal relationships blossom and thrive and prosper and grow. It's a classic example, I think, of one of those uh, situations where we don't need more spiritual IQ, but more spiritual I do. The pathway to really heaven-centered, blessed relationships, pretty simple. Jesus summed it up in this way, judge not, and you won't be judged. Uh, condemn not, and you won't be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your bosom. For with a measure you measure out, so it will be measured back to you. I mean, just take that simple, uh, almost classic, nearly cliche set of remarks that Jesus made, some of his most famous remarks, actually. 
Stop and think if we made those our compass heading in relationships. I mean, who wouldn't want to be in a relationship, first of all, with someone who wasn't judgmental, someone who wasn't always looking for a fault or a failure or something to pick apart? How about condemning? Now, the word condemning, we discovered, uh, meant the idea of actually making a righteous judgment, but in a negative way. How'd you like to be in a relationship with someone even when they had you dead to rights, even when you blew it and you knew that you blew it, but they weren't going to, uh, you know, dance on your head about it. They, they weren't going to buy into that, well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget kind of mind game that we often play. No, it, it's just gone because we've been forgiven for so much. Forgive and it will be forgiven you. Oh, boy. Forgiveness covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? Who wouldn't want to be in a relationship with a forgiving person or a generous person? One who's not in a relationship for what they can get, but for what they can give. Well, if we just applied those principles, we'd be a lot better off. And we discovered that applying those principles to our lives isn't something that will happen because, you know, we've got a checklist or we've put a three by five card up on the fridge with a vegetable magnet and we're going to try to walk in these ways. It requires an inward heart transformation. The inward heart transformation that only comes by following the master of relationships. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the embodiment of perfect love. And so having talked about the pathway to ultimate blessing, not only in the vertical in our relationship with God, but in the horizontal, we're told he concluded these sayings and he entered Capernaum, which was on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, kind of his HQ. And we're told there in Capernaum, a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. A very interesting character comes on the scene here. He's an unknown character as far as his name is concerned, but his profession, fascinating indeed. A centurion. Now, a centurion, for those of you not familiar with the term, was a Roman soldier of significant rank. The word centurion, we get our term century from it, uh, meant that a person was over uh, 100 Roman soldiers. You had to rise through the ranks in order to achieve this particular designation. You had to be able to be literate uh, in order to be able to read orders. You had to have connections. A centurion would only be promoted to that position through letters of recommendation from influential people. You had to be at least 30 uh, and uh, have already served in the military and serve with distinction. There are a couple different ways to become a centurion. Some people became centurions because of their political co connections, but most centurions got into that position because they had distinguished themselves in acts of heroism in battle. The other soldiers looked at him and said, that's a guy that I'm willing to follow. A uh, Roman historian named Vegetus uh, said this about centurions. The centurion in the infantry is chosen for his size, strength, and dexterity in throwing his missile weapons and for his skill in the use of sword and shield. In short, for his expertness in all these exercises. He is to be vigilant, temperate, active, and readier to execute orders he receives than to talk about them. <laughs> I like that. Strict in exercising and keeping up proper discipline among his soldiers in obliging them to appear clean and well-dressed and to have their weapons constantly rubbed and bright. Now, if you're going to be a centurion, you've had to work your way up through the ranks. I guess our rough equivalent of being a centurion in uh, our day and age would be someone, if you're in the military, who's become a master sergeant. You know, the, the highest rank you could achieve as an enlisted individual without actually becoming an officer. Now, among centurions, there were centurions who distinguished themselves above the level even of other centurions. And if you got to that place, you would be called in as a consultant with the generals and with, say, the uh, representatives of the emperor and so forth to offer your consultation on how battle strategy should be accomplished. When you got to that place, centurions were extremely well paid. They were considered a part of the aristocracy, and we'll see that that's significant for our study here in just a moment. This centurion, this individual that was over 100, had something else going for him. Remember, this is a centurion who is stationed in Capernaum in Israel. Because of that, he was not a popular individual among the average Jewish person. 
Remember, the Romans have conquered the Jews. They are squarely under the steel-reinforced sandal of imperial Rome. In fact, being under Roman rule was often oppressive. It was tyrannical. You didn't have any rights. And as such, the average Jewish person, when they saw a Roman soldier, let alone a centurion, they would look the other way or just scowl or spit at you rather than greet you. In fact, there was a sect of Judaism called the Zealots who believed that the best way to worship Yahweh was to bring along a hidden dagger with you, and if you had the chance, take out a Roman soldier. Well, if you really wanted to score points among your fellow zealots, the best way to do that would be to take out a key officer. This centurion literally went to work every day with a bullseye painted on his back. And yet, and yet, this individual who had risen through the ranks who had seen warfare, who had uh, become who he was because he was an expert soldier, wasn't hardened by the experience. As a matter of fact, we are told that the crisis he was dealing with was because a servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. Now, here we see a couple of amazing statements that can easily escape you if you're not careful. First of all, this man's servant, his slave was considered dear to him. Now, that didn't happen very often in Roman culture. If you were a servant, you were essentially a non-person. You fell into that point where you uh, couldn't pay your bills and so forth, and you were sold into slavery. Uh, they would even change your name. You wouldn't be called by your given name anymore. You'd be called by a number. If in the New Testament you've heard people re being referred to by the name Tertius or Quartus, these were slave names. It literally meant number three or number four. You know, I'm old enough to remember a uh, hit song from the late 60s called Secret Agent Man where it talked about giving you a number and taking away your name. Well, that's exactly what would happen to you if you became a slave. Uh, slaves were completely disposable individuals. They were no longer considered human beings. They were objects. If you were a slave owner and a slave displeased you for any reason, you could kill that slave in any way you saw fit with no consequences whatsoever. One Roman historian describes uh, one slave owner who dispatched his servants, who didn't measure up, by keeping a pond full of hungry eels. And he would toss the servants into them and let the eels consume him for his amusement. No consequence, right? So the average slave's life, life was brutal, nasty, and short. Not so in this case. This centurion apparently looked at people through a different lens because this servant was dear to him. Now, Luke uses a term, he was sick and ready to die. The word sick literally translated in the original language means he had it bad. That's how you would literally translate that. Now, the parallel account of this that we find in the book of Matthew adds a couple of details. In Matthew chapter 8, we are told that this servant was paralyzed and racked with pain. Now, we don't know what caused the paralysis. We don't know what the source was. Was it an accident? Was it a, an infection? Was it a disease like meningitis or something along this line? We don't know. But suffice it to say, this servant was on death door. He was almost as good as dead. So this centurion in this crisis situation, makes a very interesting decision. Verse 3 says, When he'd heard about Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built for us a synagogue. Boy, now this guy really takes on some interesting characteristics. First of all, he sends the elders of the Jews as emissaries to communicate his message to Jesus. Now, those of you who are semi-advanced Bible students who uh, maybe have encountered this before, in Matthew chapter 8, uh, when we read the account there, it seems like Jesus is having a conversation with a centurion directly. But Luke tells us that this conversation was conducted through these emissaries. Uh, some people say, well, that's a contradiction. No, it really it's not. What it's describing is the fact that when this centurion sent these emissaries to Jesus, they were representing his perspective 
perfectly. Much like an ambassador uh, for the United States dealing with another nation doesn't offer their takes, their two cents worth. They merely communicate what the interests of our nation are to the other heads of state. In the same way, these representatives would communicate and take the place, if you will, of the centurion himself. Now, notice something about this centurion. They begged him earnestly, saying that he should do this, for he was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. You know, if you take a trip to Israel and visit Capernaum, you'll find the ancient site of Capernaum. It's called Telhum in our day. But if you go to Capernaum, one of the sites you'll see, and we'll show you a picture of it, is a, the remains of a synagogue that was built around the time of Jesus. Many scholars believe that this is the very same synagogue that this centurion, out of his own pocket, built for the Jewish people. Really impressive stuff. Even taking a look at the ruins, you can see that no expense was spared on this project. Now, we can ask ourselves this question. Where in the world did this centurion get this kind of faith? How did this guy become such a, an above and beyond the call of duty, kind of right on sort of a dude, caring about servants, using his position and his rank to bless, not curse people that cursed him on a day-by-day -day basis? Well, the short answer is this. It's a miracle. There is no way that this centurion could come to this place of doing these sort of things unless God was working in his life. You know, it's interesting. When we take a look at the New Testament and how centurions are described in general in the New Testament, without exception, they are portrayed in a positive light. Did you know that? First of all, this fellow, obviously uh, seen as a very positive individual in this scripture, uh, secondly, in the book of Acts, uh, we're told about Cornelius, the Roman centurion, who sent to Simon Peter. He was a guy who prayed to God daily, gave alms to the Jewish causes and so forth. We're told that a centurion who was at the cross of Jesus when he was crucified made the declaration, certainly this man was the Son of God. And another centurion at the end of the book of Acts, we are told, named Julius, literally saved the life of the Apostle Paul when he was going into shipwreck and uh, the captain of the, the uh, ship wanted to kill all the prisoners so that they wouldn't escape. He interceded and made sure that didn't happen. Centurions, generally speaking, even in spite of the fact that they were Gentiles, even in spite of the fact that they served the hated Roman government, God seemed to almost delight in raising these guys up for special purposes. They were walking miracles. And I'd like to share something with you today. Do you realize the reason that this centurion had faith in God was only explainable by a miracle? And do you realize something else? If you understand the good news of Jesus Christ, if you understand that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you understand that, if you made a decision to respond to God's invitation to be part of his forever family, you prayed and invited Jesus into your life, guess what? You didn't do that because you're smarter than the average bear. You didn't do that because you're more spiritual. You didn't do that because you were born in the right family from knee high to a grasshopper, your mama read you the Bible every day. You did that because God himself miraculously intervened Veined to allow you to understand that message. Without the intervention of God, you can do the most eloquent presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can have Billy Graham himself share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. And guess what? It's like explaining physics to a cow. What? What are you talking about? I mean, that was certainly my experience before I got saved. I had a lot of people try to tell me about Jesus, and it just seemed like like gibberish, like they were speaking in tongues or something like that. I had no idea what they were saying. And then I invited Christ into my life, and it was just a night and day difference. Hopefully, that's your testimony as well. Because you know, one of the sad things that I run into from time to time are people that will say something to this effect to me. Well, you know, Scott, I, I hear you talking about answers to prayer. And I hear you talking about divine appointments and how God just happened to put you at this place at this time to share with just this person. And, and you just see the Lord doing all these wonderful things in your life. 
But God doesn't do miraculous things for me. God doesn't answer my prayers miraculously. I guess he's got some favorites that he does miracles for and some that he doesn't. Nothing could be further from the truth. The greatest miracle of all is the fact that you understand the message of the good news of Jesus. That's the miracle that opens the door to every other miracle. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, we are told, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. You realize you weren't just a little off before you came to Jesus. You weren't just a little misguided. You just didn't a little calibration in your spiritual GPS. You're dead in trespasses and sins. Unless God makes you alive, you spin in your wheels. Each and every person who makes a decision to be a born-again Christian is no less a miracle than this centurion we see here. Isn't that an amazing thing? Something to be thankful for each and every day. Now, here we see that this centurion's faith began by God's direct, miraculous manifestation. And this faith was already producing results. This guy had put his money where his mouth was as far as having respect and honor for the God of the Jewish people, building the synagogue and so on. And so these emissaries say, boy, you really ought to do this for this guy. He, he really deserves it. Interesting, the Jewish emissaries felt he was worthy. This centurion had a completely different take on his own worthiness. Look at verse 6. It says, Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. Now, a couple things here. First, the centurion sends another group to meet with him. The Jewish group has met with Jesus. They're heading for the house. Another group cuts him off at the pass, if you want to use that old cliche, with this message from the centurion. Don't trouble yourself to come to my house. Now, when we hear that word, don't trouble yourself, we tend to think, ah, oh, you know, don't go out of your way. You know, I know you got better things to do. You know, you don't really have time for all. It could be an inconvenience going on here. That's not what this word means in the original language. The word trouble here comes from a Greek root word that means to flay someone open with a whip. In other words, what he was saying is, I don't want to put you through the pain that will come your way if you come to my house. Now, what, what, what possible pain could that be? Remember something, this is a centurion. He is used to dealing with Jewish culture and customs. He is a Gentile on the outside looking in at the Jewish people. And he understood something. For Jesus to come to his house would have been, if you'll pardon the expression, a party foul uh, on a nuclear level. For Jesus to enter into a Gentile's house would have completely discredited his ministry. Now, as far as Jews were concerned, the idea of being in a Gentile's house was completely against the law of Moses. If you don't believe that's true, read through Acts chapter 10. When Cornelius, the Roman centurion there, was visited by an angel who said to Cornelius, send down to Joppa, Find this guy, Simon Peter. He will tell you how to be saved. It took not one, not two, but three visions from God to get Peter to go and share the gospel with Cornelius and his family. And even then, he had to be dragged kicking and screaming. Even then, his first words out of his mouth is, you know how it is unlawful for me as a Jew to be under the roof of a Gentile. But I was told I should call nothing common or unclean that God has declared clean. So I came as I was ordered. What can I do for you? This is hardly what I would call seeker sensitive, right? This is hardly what I call bridge building going on here. But that's how the culture worked. And this centurion, you know, again, if you're going to be a centurion and be in charge of 100 men, you've got to be pretty good at military intelligence. He done his intelligence work. He'd heard about Jesus. He not only heard what Jesus could do, but he probably also had a very good idea of what Jesus' critics were all about. You remember Jesus' critics? We've met them so far in the book of Luke. Sin sniffers, propriety police, the ones that were so 
desperate to find something to discredit Jesus for. They actually chewed Jesus' disciples out for taking little heads of grain of wheat and making them into an impromptu granola snack because it was on the Sabbath day. Ah, you're making granola. You broke the Sabbath. Seriously? Really? Yeah, really. They'd look for any reason to discredit Jesus because he didn't conform himself to their steel-reinforced spiritual sensibilities. The centurion knew that. The centurion knew that if Jesus went under his roof, they would have everything they needed to not only discredit Jesus, but probably end up destroying him. And so he says, don't trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter my roof. Therefore, I do not even think myself worthy to come to you. In other words, the reason I'm not out there talking to you is because I know who you are and I know who I am. Now, if you've been part of that Jewish delegation, you probably said, not worthy? What do you mean you're not worthy? You're a Roman centurion, for goodness sake. You, you got one of the highest possible honors militarily you could ever achieve. Not worthy? You've got enough resources that you even built us a synagogue. Not worthy? Come on, don't you think you're being a little hard on yourself? No. This guy had a healthy sense of who he was because he didn't compare himself with other people. He compared himself with who Jesus is. And, and if you want true humility, you know, it's funny. Humility has been called the most elusive of all virtues because as soon as you really believe that you're humble, you're not, right? <laughs> I mean, how, how do you work that one out? But you see, humility isn't thinking too low of yourself. It's obviously not thinking too high of yourself. It's getting to the point where you don't think about yourself at all, where it's not about you. It's about God. And that's exactly what uh, this centurion is communicating here. He goes, I'm not worthy to meet you. I'm not worthy for you to come to me. But say the word and my servant will be healed. Now, I love this because this man had confidence in Jesus, born of his own experience. Verse 8 says, For I am also a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, Go, and he goes, and another, Come, and he comes. And my servant, Do this, and he does it. Now, I had the opportunity after our last service to talk to uh, a fellow who is uh, the police chief of Miranda. And I asked him, I said, how many uh, people do you have serving underneath? He says, oh, about 130. I said, well, I'm talking to a centurion right now. And, and I said, is there a problem if one of your officers doesn't follow orders? Oh, yeah, there's a big problem. They don't follow orders. Uh, they, they don't usually get to do it more than twice. In battle, in combat, boy, you either follow orders or people die. This guy knew all about having authority. He knew all about having discipline. He knew all about keeping his regiment in shape. And he looked at Jesus and says, I know a thing or two about getting things done. And you're a guy who gets things done. When you speak, things happen. I've seen it. I've experienced it. And I see it in you. Now, Interesting, when Jesus heard these things, and this is the, the high water mark of this whole passage, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Now, a couple of things here. Jesus hears this and he marvels at him. The word marvel in the original language, incredibly strong. It carries the idea of being shocked or stunned, amazed. Even slack-jawed. You know, the, the place where you're just like, oh, I can't believe this. It, it carries the idea of being amazed at how wonderful something is. In fact, in the book of Second Thessalonians chapter 1, we are told that we will be amazed in the same way when we see Jesus face to face. Jesus was shocked. Shocked at this man's faith. How interesting, we're told in the book of Mark, chapter 6 and verse 6, one of the only other times that uh, this word is used regarding Jesus in the Gospels, that he was amazed at the unbelief that the people in Nazareth 
who should have known him best showed him. Here it's the opposite. He's amazed at this guy's faith. Can I ask you a question? When Jesus looks at your faith, what's his reaction to it? What is his reaction when he sees your faith in action? You know, I, I thought about that. And, 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 you know, this idea of Jesus being amazed, you know, stunned, wide-eyed, that sort of thing. You know, sometimes I think the Lord looks at my faith, and the first thing he does is he, he does something like this. He rolls his eyes, right? Hardly amazed. Sometimes I think, you know, even when I'm probably doing as good as I can do, he kind of goes, oh, you know, <laughs> got a cute, he's dry in here. But how many times have you ever had an experience where you think the Lord looks at you and he's just like, oh, wow, that's awesome. That's just what I'm looking for. <laughs> that's the goal, you see. This Roman centurion, this guy raised in the bosom of pagan culture, this guy who was just nurtured on this idea of Roman pride and we're all over the top of it and who are these Jews to tell us what to do or what to think, especially about spiritual things, this guy who shouldn't have got it. He's the guy who gets it. He's the guy who understood who Jesus was and what Jesus could do. And who he was in relationship to Jesus. Jesus <laughs> marveled at him and told the crowd that followed, and I imagine this blew their minds, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. <laughs> great faith. He goes, this is great faith. I haven't even found this in Israel. Now, when you think about even the disciples themselves, Jesus never used the term great faith when he was talking to them. Uh, remember when Simon Peter exercised what we would call great faith, right? Getting out of the boat, walking on the water to Jesus. And then he starts looking at the wind and the waves and he starts to sink and Jesus rescued him. And what did Jesus say to, to Peter? Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In fact, later on, Jesus would say to his disciples, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be cast in the seed, it would obey you. Nothing would be impossible for you. In other words, you guys are not what I call people of great faith. And they were the ones Jesus chose. They were the ones who saw his miracles. They were the ones who heard him teach in public situations. They were the ones he discipled privately. And yet he never used that phrase, great faith, to describe them. Who gets it? This Gentile, this Roman centurion, the least likely person we could ever imagine to have great faith, has great faith. Why is that? So God would be glorified. So no human being could glory in God's presence. Well, of course. This guy's got great faith. He, he sat under the greatest Jewish teachers who explained it. No. Well, of course, he's got great faith. I'm sure he saw of Jesus. No, he just heard about Jesus. He hadn't actually seen Jesus at all at this point. They'd never even been formally introduced. He's got great faith for one reason. Same reason we can have great faith. It takes a miracle. It takes God giving you great faith. And the reason I point that out to you is this. Sooner or later, we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we're going to need great faith. And sooner or later, we're going to find ourselves, our emotions, our circumstances, maybe even some uh, less than helpful Job's counselors are going to be saying, you still hold your integrity, curse God and die. Uh, we're going to find ourselves in a place where we need great faith. Great faith should never be confused with great feelings. Because great faith is doing what God calls you to do in spite of how you feel, in spite of your circumstances, in spite of the results. You do it and you hang in there simply because you trust God, not because you see results. That is great faith. That's the kind of faith that God's looking for. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. 
<laughs> understand? When it says well there, the, the word in the original language is really interesting. We get our root word uh, hygiene from it. In other words, he was completely hygienic. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but if you'd been there in that house and you're sitting there with a sick bed and, you know, you're this Roman centurion is just, you know, agonizing over the fact that, that, that this servant who's dear to him is hurting and suffering. And if you're a parent and you've had a child who is hurting and suffering, you've ever had that feeling in your heart, oh, if only I could tra trade places. I, I take that on in a minute. I'm sure that this Roman centurion was feeling all of that, and, and he had no idea when this conversation was going to take place. He had no idea when this, these emissaries were going to meet Jesus. But right at that moment, suddenly, bang, this servant who was paralyzed started to move. This person who was racked with pain found relief. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've been in great pain and found relief. I mean, it's like, oh, man, I had a kidney stone once. They gave me a shot of morphine, and I was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Could you imagine that guy being relieved from being racked by that kind of pain? Just, oh, yeah, I don't really believe it. The color returned to him. He was just as fit as a fiddle as the day he was born. It's like, hey, 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 all's well. Can you imagine how stunned everybody was? Probably. Maybe not that centurion, though. They <laughs> probably go, well, of course. <laughs> and, you know, I, I kind of think that's true uh, in how God looks at us sometimes. If you've ever had God really save your bacon, if you've ever had God really intervene for you in a miraculous way, I, I've seen it so many times in my life. You know, I, I just, you know, the, the answer to prayer finally comes through, and you go, oh, Lord, you, you, you've delivered me. This is just, I, I can't believe it. You ever had that reaction? To an answered prayer, I'm sure God's up there going, what did you expect? I was going to leave you in the lurch. I go, oh, no, no answer for prayer for you. <laughs> I just like to see his step. Are you kidding? God's, what did you expect? Maybe that centurion goes, well, of course, because I'm a man of authority, and I know what it's like to give orders, and I know what it's like to know they're going to be followed beyond question. He just gave the order. That's why we got what we got here. You know, if you want to have a marvelous faith, a faith that <laughs> brings that look of delighted, almost surprise to the eyes of God, first of all, realize something. You've got to receive it. You've got to receive it. Don't be afraid to ask God for faith if you feel like you're kind of on shaky ground. As if he's going to turn away a request like that. Ask God to give you that faith. Secondly, don't be afraid to come to God in a moment of crisis. Yeah, sometimes they think, oh, boy, you know, I haven't been doing my prayer time. I've really been, my church attendance has been spotty, and now i got this big deal. And, you know, I'm coming to God, and I'm sure God's got his arms folded going, okay, now you're coming to me. <laughs> Where were you when things are going good? Don't ever think that way. You know, in, in Psalm 50, in verse 15, God's word to you is this, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Period. God doesn't care why you come. He just cares that you come. He'll take care of all the rest of that stuff. And finally, you know, when you come to God, when you come to him and you take the things that matter most to you and you put them in his hands, boy, trust him. Trust him. Rely upon him. I love what Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says about this. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Lord, thank you for your amazing word. And thank you, Lord, that you're a trustworthy God. Sometimes, Lord, our eyes deceive us. Sometimes even the counsel we might get from those around us can lead us astray. Certainly our emotions, Lord, uh, they're excellent servants but poor masters. And uh, by gauging what's going on in our life through any of those things, uh, boy, we can end up in a peck of trouble in a big-time hurry. But, Lord, the way to peace, the way to joy, the way to fulfillment, the way to living a life that really pleases you is simply learning to trust in you and to trust you with those things that matter most to us. 
Father, I pray even right now your spirit would search our hearts and just do an inventory of the things that matter most to us and that we would uh, just present them to you with an open hand, allowing you to put into our hands those things that are necessary and to take out of our lives, maybe even those things we think that are necessary that maybe are just holding us down. God, thank you that you have a purpose and a plan for our lives. And the more confidence we have in you, the more we learn to trust and rely on you, the better off we're going to be. Help us to follow this unnamed, unknown centurion's example and bring a smile to your face and an amazed shock when we finally get it. We finally learn to trust in you. We thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen.